Good morning, afternoon, and evening to all. Welcome to the SFSP session three, the science of characterizing and assessing the transition towards more sustainable food systems. We're honored to have Dr. Jean-Francois Susanna, Vice President of International Policy at the French National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and the Environment, and co-lead of the scientific group for Action Track 1 of the UN Food Systems Summit to open this session for us. Jean-Francois, welcome. Thank you, Alison, and uh, really glad to be with you. Um, I'm trying to share my screen uh, now. Hope you can see it, but for me, it's blinking. Something's happening. Is it? Not sure. <clears throat> well, maybe I will uh, just. Uh, okay, I will try again. I will stop it and try again. Yes, now it is working. Okay, really uh, glad to be with you today and uh, to introduce uh, action tracks uh, within uh, the Food Systems Summit. And uh, we are working uh, with the science group on action track one. It is a frame for the tracks because uh, ensuring safe and nutritious food for all uh, requires a shift to sustainable production, which is action track three, and consumption patterns, action track two. And with Action Track 3, you have co-benefits for climate and the environment, while with, uh, this leads to also inclusive development uh, and uh, equitable livelihoods. This is Action Track 4. And to achieve this, you need increased coordination, transparency, and accountability uh, that will help build resilience to the vulnerabilities. And this is Action Track 5. So you see that we are really with a, an inclusive uh, framework for those Action Tracks and uh, it is uh, interesting to see uh, that uh, we have, sorry, I have a problem in changing slide, that unfortunately we are not on track to meet the international tra targets, uh, be it for malnutrition uh, with uh, the three components of uh, undernourishment, uh, the obesity and overweight, but also uh, the micronutrients deficiencies. We are not on track for food safety, but uh, we are not knowing enough also of the burden of the foodborne diseases. And certainly inequality and poverty is uh, creating a huge burden uh, for food saf safety of malnutrition. We need to take a step back and think about food systems uh, as a matter of a link between social foundation and ecological ceiling. And uh, in this sort of donut uh, diagram uh, that uh, it has become quite popular, you can see uh, this ecological ceiling in terms of the planetary boundaries, uh, some of them being climate change, uh, others being the land use change, uh, or the nitrous, nitrogen and phosphorus loading. And uh, this exerts a pressure, but on the other hand, we need to keep the social foundation uh, that uh, brings uh, food for all. Indeed, when we look at the land-based systems, we realize that there are a number of challenges. And interestingly, in the IPCC special report on land, we could see that the greater the number of land challenges, the lower the human development index. So this really points to the fact that so challenges are concentrated in the poorest countries. And you see this is obviously the case also for food insecurity. What was interesting is that we could study the uh, co-benefits and trade-offs of the land management responses, but uh, also of uh, responses in terms of uh, demand management. Uh, you see here that in blue, we have uh, co-benefits. So uh, responses that can actually uh, have positive impacts on a number of challenges, be it for climate change, for land degradation or desertification, for food security, biodiversity, and in some cases, for water issues, groundwater stress and water quality. So if you just take one example, restoring soils, increasing the soil organic carbon content has positive impacts on all those dimensions. On the other hand, when we look at some options like bioenergy and uh, the carbon capture and sequestration, we see there are some possibilities if this is deployed at large scale, 
that we create negative impacts on trade-offs across challenges. So I think it is important to have this complexity in mind when we look at the interconnected drivers for the food systems, uh, which encompass production, harvesting, processing, consumption, and uh, we have these socioeconomic drivers. Uh, these are related also uh, with the climate change and land use impacts. And we are looking also into supply chain failures and underutilized technologies that could uh, bring some options for responses in a context of globalization, but also of conflicts and fragility. So when we try to look into the responses, uh, we certainly need to do more about coordination between supply and demand, uh, socioeconomics, science, technology, and innovation, and accountability of uh, the different components in a context, obviously, that needs to favor peace and resilience. So these are some thoughts, so uh, very brief introduction, really, to uh, the work we are starting now with the science group uh, and the priorities for action. Some essential ingredients are about whole system approaches, investigating the win-wins and trade-offs, adaptive learning, knowledge sharing, understanding of the context, and uh, possible priorities, we are not yet with the final priorities, is uh, to better coordinate the data, uh, to have better accounting, also with indicators. I think you will talk about this further. To have national food system action plans, that's really critical, and to consider the costs of acting and not acting. Uh, usually the costs uh, of not acting are several times higher than the cost of action. Uh, and indeed, uh, this needs to be uh, nested into capacity building and uh, the development uh, of uh, societies. So I think I will stop there and uh, I would like to thank you. Uh, and uh, if you like to have a closer look at uh, the science group work, uh, please uh, do so and look into the papers we have produced for each uh, action track. Thank you. And I hand it to Chris. Good Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Jean-Francois. So uh, this, um, this session, this session three, which is on assessing the scientific foundation and the meaning of the indicators that we use to try to measure and monitor the sustainability of our food system. Um, so this session, what, what was the motivation, the rationale for, 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 for that and on what are we trying to achieve uh, today? So the background is the, the flurry of project initiative that have emerged in the recent years, which propose to measure the sustainability of our food systems. So many of those initiatives are led by universities, national or international research organizations. Yet, uh, I think it's fair to say that there is no agreement or no general consensus, if you want, on what exactly the sustainability of food system is on how to measure it. So that means that each of those propositions, those projects, are usually based on totally different series of indices or indicators. Yet they all claim that they tell us something about the sustainability of our food system. A lot of those indices are also the result of the combination of multiple indicators, sometimes dozens of them or even more, which make the interpretation of those results difficult uh, for experts, of course, but certainly for decision makers. So in that session, um, I have invited or we have invited the leaders of three of the most recent initiative on food system sustainability measurement, and I will introduce them in a minute. And the idea is not for them to present in detail or to advocate for their own work, but rather to share with us the challenges, the problem that they faced uh, when they were trying to build or to design their indices. The area where they know more work is necessary to address some of the conceptual or some of the technical issues. Uh, so really this session is, is about having a critical look and an open discussion hopefully around the current attempt that are being proposed about the measurement of food system sustainability and to highlight some of the challenges that are being faced. So the way the session will be organized, first we will ask those uh, three presenters to very succinctly in five minutes max, 
to present their initiatives. And then we will follow up by a 40 minutes uh, discussion where the uh, presenters will be asked to share their views about some of the uh, conceptual and on, on technical challenges or problems that are related to the measurement of food system uh, sustainability. So the, the first of those three presenters is Martin Coring. Martin is working with the Economist Intelligence Unit and uh, it will present a very brief overview of what the, uh, the it has developed with the economic intelligence unit which is called the food sustainability index martin the floor is you for five minutes great thank you very much chris and uh, thank you very much to the organizers uh, for having me um, so just a, a couple of words uh, on the uh, food sustainability index so this is an effort uh, really to um, engage policymakers, the private sector and uh, civil society on the key challenges that are uh, faced uh, by food systems and building uh, food systems around the world. We started in 2016 with um, with a couple of countries. I mean, we had uh, initially only uh, 20 or so countries and then we expanded the index uh, in the second year, 2017, to around 33. And then um, in 2018, the latest iteration of the index, we expanded to 67 countries. And so uh, this is really based on the um, BCF and Milan protocol, which was adopted in 2015, which uh, came up with three pillars to build a sustainable food system. And you can see here on this slide, uh, the key pillars, food loss and waste, sustainable agriculture and nutritional challenges. And these are really um, the key challenges that we are facing because they, uh, in, a, in a way, are um, paradoxical. You know, you, we have um, the problem of um, one billion uh, people suffering from hunger, but the, at the same time, we have a third of food uh, being lost or wasted. So food loss and waste is a, is a key component. We have sustainable agriculture in it because, as we know, the world is running out of cultivatable land. Uh, we need more sustainable farming techniques. At the same time, we have the challenge of climate change. Um, we have uh, nutritional challenges. We have, uh, at the same time, you know, the, this, this double burden of uh, hunger and growing uh, obesity around the world. So these are the three core pillars. And we then um, came up with, um, for the latest iteration, 37 indicators and 89 individual metrics to address the societal, environmental, and economic uh, themes around uh, sustainable food systems. So this is really an effort by the Economist Intelligence Unit, uh, which is part of the Economist Group, uh, kind of the research arm and thought leadership arm of the Economist Group. And we worked with the Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition, as well as an advisory board of academics and uh, thought leaders and influencers in the field of uh, building sustainable food systems. Our definition of food sustainability is that it's uh, the ability of a country's food system to be maintained without depletion and exhaustion of natural resources or compromise to health and integrity and without compromising future generations access to food so this is our basis so we very much start um, you know on the basis of the, the challenges we are facing those three challenges rather than necessarily an outcome that we want to achieve with this so we really want to engage policymakers um, economists, businesses, and civil society. And just in terms of the key indicators we have, this is just a selection of the kind of indicators we looked at. So for example, for food loss and waste, we looked at both input and output indicators. So we looked at uh, the food loss, uh, both in terms of you know post-harvest um, and, and during the agricultural production, as well as um, we looked at uh, consumer and retail uh, food waste, um, but we also looked at the the kind of input indicators such as the policy response to food loss, uh, the, the policy response to food waste. Uh, we looked at the causes of the distribution level loss, for example, and the kind of solutions uh, uh, for this uh, distribution level loss, for example. So both input and output, but with a focus on uh, output. Uh, indicators for sustainable agriculture. We looked at um, the three broader, ca um, you know, categories. We looked at for you know, we looked at land, uh, air, and, and water, and we really wanted to highlight, you know, things like um, water withdrawals from agriculture, initiatives to recycle water. We looked at fish stocks as well. We looked at um, agricultural subsidies. We looked at biodiversity. Uh, we looked at the role of women in farming. So we also had social and societal indicators in there, uh, income uh, levels for farmers, for example. Uh, 
example, uh, we looked at uh, climate change mitigation indicators and greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, for example. But we also looked again at um, more kind of kind of you know uh, input indicators such as R and D spending um, and those kind of things and laws to protect smallholders. And for nutritional challenges, we looked at um, indicators such as uh, undernourishment, stunting, micronutrient deficiency. But we also looked at um, overweight. If we looked at nutrition deficiencies, um, we also looked at the, the the twin issue of physical activity because we, we can't really see physical activity detached from nutrition. Um, and we also looked at income indicators such as the Gini coefficient and policy response as well. So we had a mix of input and output, but again, with a focus on, on, on output indicators. Um, so the data situation, as I said, is in 2018, but we are actively developing, uh, uh, you know, the process of um, creating a new iteration of the index. We're very excited um, to work with with all of you on, you know, refining the index and, and making it even more impactful. Thank you very much. And I'm excited to talk to you about uh, how we did it and how we can uh, make it even better. Thank you, Martin. That uh, thank you for staying first of all within the time. So Martin has just presented the, the food sustainability index uh, that has been developed with the uh, economist unit. So now I would like to um, introduce you to Victoria de Bourbon and Carla Omes that will present together. So they're working for the World Bank, uh, sorry, the World Benchmarking Alliance. And they will be presenting now the food and agriculture benchmark. So please, Victoria and Carla, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris and the organization. Looking forward. It's actually going to be me presenting and then uh, Carla and I will both uh, take your, your, your questions. Um, and I think the most important takeaway from our introduction to this for the viewers to have a clear understanding of, of what our focus is, is. So if there's one key thing to take away, the World Benchmarking Alliance is focused on uh, improving company performances. So we really look at a company level, well as um, we, we've just done a presentation on a national level, we might see on a product level, but we've tried to uh, translate the SDGs into the systems that where business needs to transform to really realize uh, these SDGs. And so if, if we look at the food and agricultural uh, benchmark and food and agricultural system transformation, uh, we've tried to align obviously with all the knowledge and, and, and platforms that are out there. So, so each of us uh, and the panel today have, 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 have uh, lots of contact with each other and, uh, and, and, and try to make really clear guidance, in this case for companies, where the roadmap is, where the expectations lie. And for food and agriculture, we translated that into um, a benchmark circulating around three critical dimensions, which is nutrition, environment, and social indicators. And my next slide will dive more deeply into each of those indicators, which uh, my colleague Carla Homes, who you will see later on, has been very actively developing. So this is our framework, and these are the topics that we have uh, produced around nutrition, environment, and social. And, and it, it's, it's a translation of, as Jean-Francois said, how you can link supply and demand, because in, uh, the companies in scope of our benchmark are actually very broad. We have 350 companies in scope from farm to fork. So you'd have input companies, but also retailers. And, and I think we'd all agree that, that from each of those dimensions are relevant in one way or the other. And, and to just put it out there, I think nutrition is, is the most tricky one to really have it applicable and, 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 base, and have science-based targets for the different companies, for example, more upstream companies. But, but I think we all agree, and, and we've spoke to many nutritionists about this, that a healthy nutritional diet star starts with healthy soils, with a healthy seed, and all the way down to the value chain where it ends up on people's plates. So it's about accessibility, affordability, and, and how companies are really working on promoting a healthy, healthy diet. And are they actually doing that? And to what, what degree? And the same goes for the environmental bit. We've seen that a lot of consumer facing companies are being scrutinized on this to, to make transparent where they are sourcing their ingredients from. So this environmental pillar is, is very crucial along, along the entire system and along the 
all for all the companies in the value chain. And of course, social, social inclusion. Social inclusion um, in, in our framework really is from, from a farmer level to all the way to the workers um, and, and the broader society that is that is involved. So that we can't have, of course, a healthy, well-functioning uh, food system if workers are not paid an equal, uh, an, a fair living wage. And 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 if, if basic human rights are not being upheld. So that is is the reasoning behind behind our framework and we look forward to diving into this more deeply very good uh, i was almost caught uh, by uh, how precisely you, you you've been managed to uh, summarize uh, very frequently your uh, uh, your initiative so the food and agricultural benchmark thank you so much victoria so what I'd like to now do is to actually invite uh, the, the third uh, and the, the last of our presenters. So Jessica, Jessica Afonso from the uh, John Hopkins Universities. Jessica, with a team of uh, wider team, and she will probably explain that, have developed what they call the food system dashboard. So Jess, please uh, tell us a bit more about that food system dashboard. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Chris, for 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 inviting me to be here. It's always a pleasure to share a stage with you. I'm going to present uh, the food systems dashboard. Um, and uh, let me get my slides. Sorry about that. OK. So the the food systems uh, dashboard was something that we um, started and launched in this past June, June of 2020, in which we attempted to uh, pull together lots of public, publicly available data into one place. This was an initiative started by Johns Hopkins University, again, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, FAO, and other partners. And why we felt there was a need for such a tool is because there's lots of data out there on food systems. But it's often hard to find. Uh, it's across many different uh, databases. Sometimes those databases are hard to navigate. And it leaves decision makers who have to make decisions about food systems and how to shape, change, improve those food systems. It leaves them in the dark. If you cannot find data, what you can't measure, you can't manage, you can't govern. So we really wanted to create an interface that pulls all this data together in an easy to use uh, platform. And so uh, what we've done is, if this is the main web page and you can see the URL, we've pulled together over 170 indicators covering all aspects of food systems, food supply chains, food environments, outcomes of food systems, and the drivers of food systems representing just about every country in the world. And it provides a macro view of food systems use, using visually appealing graphics. We try to make it easier to, to understand some of the data behind uh, the food systems. You can look at data deeply. You can uh, do print out country profiles. You can look at data by income. You can look at data by a food system type. So we've got lots of data out there. Um, we've, we have had challenges, though, and I'll just highlight a few of them. Um, one is that there's lots of gaps in data. There are some areas of the food system where we have very little data that represents all countries. So, for example, consumer behavior, we don't have a lot of data on. We have a lot of outdated data. Some data just isn't available very frequently, particularly nutrition outcome data that comes around every three, four, five years, or if a country is going through a conflict, 15, 20 years. We have some data that, that we try to get access to, but it's closed. It's not open access. It's behind a paywall. Um, we've had the uh, benefit of entering into a partnership with Euromonitor that has a lot of food environment, food retail data that they have given to the dashboard as open access as a global public good. And the other issue is real-time data, not a lot of data to 
make quick decisions about food systems in real time, and inequities in data. There's lots of data in the United States. U United States uh, Department of Agriculture is wonderful in the amount of and high quality of data, but there's other countries that struggle to collect a, a lot of data. So there's real inequities in the kind of data we can show. And I would say the other big gap that almost everyone asks about when they go to the dashboard is subnational data. The ability to drill down uh, to food systems and environments within countries, within districts, subnationally. So um, that is the struggle that we have now, but we're gonna be building out the dashboard to have subnational uh, data but also um, we are working on building out more indicators uh, that cover environment and sustainable diets and also trying to better link up to create a more systems uh, thinking to the dashboard. We'll have diagnostics of how countries are, are doing with their food systems and some policy recommendations that uh, policymakers that are working on food systems can consider if they want to improve their food system. And I'll end there. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Jess. Um, so just, just finished the, the, the third presentation. So you had very, uh, very short. So what I would obviously uh, invite or suggest for the audience is obviously in five minutes, they didn't have the time to go into the detail of, of what their own initiative is about. So. I would invite you, if you have technical or, or clarification questions, to actually probably contact those presenters. I know there's a couple of questions already in the, the chat box, uh, which they may uh, want to review later. But what I want to do now is actually open up uh, a discussion between the, the four of them, the three initiatives and the four people that have uh, presented those initiatives. Um, and uh, we have a series of, of five Themes which we would like to explore. And again, the objective of this presentation is really to be open to some of the challenges that actually uh, uh, Jess has started to unpack. Because I think it's important for the audience to realize that beyond those very complex uh, indices, there's a series of, of assumptions, there's a series of, of mental models that uh, are important because they, they have actually probably influenced some of the choices that those people that have developed those indices um, have. So um, I will start with the first question and, and, and um, just to, to make you uh, sort of prepared. So I will ask uh, Martin first and then Carla and then Jess to respond. So um, the first question is, is really about one, one thing which really is appearing in the free presentation, the fact that Systematically, a lot of those uh, indices are based on a lot of indicators, and, and just mentioned 170 indicators. Uh, so, the question I have for you, three, uh, starting with you, Martin, would be: What are actually, or what were the criteria that you were using to select, to include, or to exclude particular indicators in your index, in or in your dashboard? So, the way I want to do it is. Each of you, if you could respond to those questions in two, two minutes, so we have the time to hear the three of you. So, Martin, first, how did you base or what criteria did you use to select particular indicators and uh, uh, other others? Please, over to you. Thanks, uh, Chris. So, uh, just in terms of you know how we started, as, as I mentioned in the presentations, we started with the 2015 Milan Protocol. So we actually had an authoritative document at, and, and kind of agreement as the basis. So we already knew that you know we wouldn't go into all kinds of things. So, for example, food safety or things that were not included in the Milan Protocol. So we looked at those three areas that I mentioned: uh, food waste and loss, sustainable agriculture, and uh, sustainable nutrition. So the indicators were very much driven by this basis that we had. And then, obviously, what we wanted to do with this index is to have really a wide range of countries included. So we wanted to have uh, around 90% at least of the uh, of global GDP covered and uh, around four fifths of the global population. Also, we really wanted to be representative and that's why we have about 35 high income, 23 uh, middle income and nine low income countries. So we, we wanted to have 
um, not only those countries where data availability, for example, is the strongest, but we wanted to have a wide range of different income groups represented. Um, and that also uh, caused difficulties, as some of the other speakers have mentioned, in terms of data availability. So we wanted to have a comprehensive index because it's so broad, because it has a lot of countries, because it is aimed at business policymakers and civil society it has to be brought. That's why we have so many indicators uh, now with kind of 37 indicators and 89 individual metrics. But data availability is really one of the drivers in terms of which one we then included and excluded. So um, when we looked at some of those indicators that we had, for example, uh, if we look at like food waste and loss, for example, the, the, the data there is, is, is not easily available. So we changed um, the indicators through the, the, the different years because uh, we looked at how can we calculate food loss and waste better, for example. Uh, we also looked at indicators that are more aligned with the SDGs, for example. We wanted to really make sure that um, you know, the, 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 the index represents the SDG. So we included indicators such as access to finance, access to fintech, protection for land users, sovereign debt, all these kind of indicators because we felt that they, they aligned the index more with uh, the SDGs. So it's really data availability, alignment with the SDGs, and the ability to include a wide range of countries based on those three pillars that we had identified that really drove which indicators to include and which one to exclude. Okay, thank you, Martin. Very clear answer. Thanks for that. Uh, Carla, can you tell us a bit more about the benchmarking initiative and how you have actually decided what uh, dimension, what, what indicators you included in it? Yeah, thanks a lot. And hello, everyone. Great uh, to be part of this today. I maybe first want to echo Jess, I think that was one of our starting points was also data availability, or basically the lack of data availability and the need for corporate data really for for the food system from farm to fork, and um, when it comes to the private sector. So we've heard from multiple stakeholders, um, that in order to engage with companies and in order to incentivize and motivate and motivate companies towards the SDGs, they need to have a knowledge about how yeah, the food system or the food sector basically is performing and not just on one topic, but really across the industry and across many topics. So that was kind of the starting point really uh, for WBA and what Victoria was alluding to before that we um, yeah, really were aiming to translate the global agendas of food system transformation um, and the yeah, scientific knowledge and reports that have come out in the yeah, previous years, as well as the SDGs, of course, in 2015, so that, the, that we were synthesizing these global goals and the agendas into a recipe for change for the private sector. Um, and we, yeah, we, of course, there's a lot in, in many areas, um, there's relevant data already existing and a lot of existing initiatives and framework really do great work. And uh, one of our like starting points of prerequisites as well is to not duplicate any data or to not duplicate any efforts. So we closely align with um, or for every indicator, we yeah, very closely looked what is already out there, what can we build up on and what can we draw from to leverage synergies. But on the other hand, um, yeah, so for example, on deforestation or in GHG emissions, we know there's great data and great guidance for companies out there, but there's also many indicators that we know are really relevant for food system transformation when it comes to farmer livelihoods or sustainable agricultural approaches, that these are pretty, um, yeah, pretty new or pretty modern when it comes to corporate assessment and measurement. So there, WBA is working with a lot of stakeholders and experts to develop indicators over time. We won't have everything in the first year and we won't have everything straight away um, or like perfect from the beginning, but we try to really look at the topics that are critical for food system transformation and where we have to see private sector action, um, either where there's good guidance out there already building up on that or develop with, with a multi-stakeholder approach, new approaches to assess corporate performance. Cool. Very good. Thank you, Carla. Uh, so I guess I'm going to turn to Jess, who have already kind of uh, indicated some of the challenges. But so again, if you could take us through 
the criteria you use to identify those 170 indicators um, and, and you know just just share with us your experience on that aspect of the the dashboard go ahead please jess Yeah, so we what we did was we used a framework, the high level panel of experts food system framework. Um, I didn't show it because it takes too long to explain. <laughs> but it, the that framework really articulates different elements of the food system and how they connect. You know, it's the different categories of food supply chain, food environments, individual factors, lots of different drivers. So what we did was we tried to populate indicators across that entire framework to really uh, try to give that systems approach. Because many uh, dashboards are just looking at a specific outcome or a specific um, set of, of indicators across supply chains. So we really wanted to use that framework and fill in as much as we could across it with different indicators. And the other criteria was really, is the data uh, publicly available? Has it been cleaned, gone through structural checks? So that first round of when the dashboard was launched with 170, I think it's about 175 indicators, um, is data that has been publicly available on FAO Stat or World Bank or UNICEF, other uh, large UN or multilateral agency global burden of disease, big, big in data endeavors. Now we're in this kind of second phase of developing uh, and adding more indicators that maybe are collected from one team in one country and they have an interesting indicator or an interesting set of data. So in that case, we're going through a, an extra vetting process with our team. Um, and what we're going to be publishing that criteria of, of, of how we go through that vetting process in the next month. So keep an eye out for that. Okay, good. So I think everybody's trying to expand further some of the dimension. Very good. The, the second, I think, very important theme that needs to be discussed um, <clears throat> is the fact that we all know food system is, is a very complex it's a beast, uh, which is very complex, multi multi-dimensional. So, uh, I would like to hear from you. Uh, on I would like to actually Carla, maybe you can start, and then Jess and Martin. So, I would like to hear from the three of you. How did you deal with the kind of uh, tension or trade-off that exists between, on one hand, the need to capture that complexity and that multi-dimensionality of food system? And on the other hand, to also stay simple, to provide something which uh, is look and, and is simple to ensure that you don't kind of overwhelm, if you want, the decision makers uh, that you're trying to help, but actually help them uh, prioritize important elements of the food system over others. So, what, how did you dealt with that tension between the complexity, the multidimensionality of food system, and the need to stay simple to help a decision makers? So, Carla, can you explain us in two minutes, and then Jess and Martin? Yeah, thanks. <coughs> I think a really good tension or yeah point you're raising here. Um, probably just to like one of WBA's mission statements in a way is like not keeping it simple because it is not simple as you're saying the food system is inherently complex but try to make it simple um, and we our starting point is as victoria has said we distilled kind of um, the three areas or the three critical dimensions for food system transformation which is environment nutrition and social um, and then within these three key dimensions let's say we have um distilled the or uh, selected the key topics where really we have to see private sector action and which are like yeah repeatedly discussed and there's consensus i think in in the global community by now that um yeah we have to see action from not only from the private sector of course but they have a critical role to play on on these topics and 
um, because WBA is going for yeah, like for broad and scale, we, we have heard before, we have 350 companies, big multinational enterprises at scope, and we look from farm to fork. Um, so we we kind of set ourselves the, like to deal with that complexity, we have said we go for broad and scale, which means when we speak about indicators that we basically translate each topic just into one indicator. And that of course means that we cannot go into all the, yeah, into each and every nuance of the topic. We cannot capture all the complexity of, of each and every topic, but working with progressive scoring guidelines, we hope to capture like really the essence of the nature of what we need to see from companies. So kind of that, yeah, let's say 80-20 rule is what we try to capture with, with these indicators we develop. And then maybe it's important to emphasize that WBA is trying, like if we understand ourselves as a bit of the um, umbrella benchmark looking all across the board and not in that degree of detail, but we link our work to existing work that's already out there. And there's great existing initiatives that, yeah, very much look in detail into specific topics and indicators. So also making that link is helping stakeholders to understand where they can dig deeper if they get kind of a high level overview and a good understanding from us in the first place. Very good. Thanks, Carla. Okay, I'm going to turn to Jess. Jess, you had also, you know, already mentioned and you were trying to show some tools where you try to address that uh, tension. But can you tell us a bit more about uh, effectively maybe something which is frustrating for all of us, that uh, trade-off between the, the beast and the simple drawing we're trying to propose to the decision makers? Yeah, I mean, I... I I think, Chris, we haven't effectively, uh, on the dashboard yet, we haven't effectively uh, shown the systems, how things connect, the, the feedback loops, the trade-offs. If you press one button, what happens to something else? I don't think we've done that yet. And Chris Chris knows this because he talked about this in detail. <laughs> He's been a great uh, critic and help on, on the dashboard. But two things we have tried to do is you if you go into the dashboard, there's two entry points, right? You can go in and do a deep dive. So if you're a data geek, you can go in through the deep dive way. There's a map. You can look at any indicator you want. You can choose the kind of graphics and how you want the data to look. The other way is a more simple way. It's a country profile way. And we've created, we've curated a set of, I think it's about 25 indicators. It's very visually appealing, easier to understand graphics. You don't have to create the graphics yourself. So that's one way of just dealing with the complexity of those people that get very overwhelmed with data. We've made it a bit easier if you go through the country profile. The second thing, and I think it was a question coming in from the audience, is what we're doing now is right now we're just describing food systems. So if you were to go to the dashboard, you get a great picture, detailed picture of what food systems look like. But then what? What do you do? What do you do with that data? So we're developing a diagnose and decide, the other two Ds. So it's decide, diagnose, de or describe, diagnose, decide. And the diagnose, again, we're taking a, a small curated set of indicators and creating thresholds. So if you are a policymaker, you could go to that diagnose view and see, okay, I'm great on food loss, but I'm not so good on the cost of diets. And I have a double burden in my country, a double burden of malnutrition. And we're trying to work, and we're doing this with Chris and colleagues, of then linking that to just certain decisions, actions that you would take. And some of that work will be linked to Corinna Hawks. She's developing something called the no regrets policies. So linking those diagnostics to decisions. So we think that will help deal with that complexity a bit. People can disregard the diagnose and decide if they want to, but it'll be there on the dashboard if people want to use that to, to filter in and, and get right to the heart of what the issues are for their food system. Yeah, yeah, yes. Some, uh, some still ongoing work. I can see that. Martin, can you share how at the uh, Economist Unit you have also uh, sort of embrace and address or try to uh, address that issues of, of 
make sure you capture all the different dimension, uh, even if you had three initially, uh, but you translate that into things that are actually simple to, to understand. That's right, Chris, and and I'd like to echo also what what uh, Carla and Jess said. So uh, we also uh, obviously we have these three broad categories, but we also try to m make it less um, overwhelming by having these uh, country profiles and country scorecards. So you can actually download all of the data and you can click on your country and you can see um, you know where your country is performing well and where it isn't performing well, how the different scores came about with some nice visualizations and so on as well. So that's one way through the country scorecards and the country profiles. Um, the other thing, I mean, we want to be comprehensive. The thing is we don't want this index to be um, simple in a way because it, 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 the purpose was really to bring all the different food system stakeholders together. So whereas, uh, you know, some of the other speakers were talking about, you know, focus on private sector action, for example, we wanted deliberately because we were working with the Barilla Foundation for Food and Nutrition as well, who's focus is very much bringing all of the stakeholders together, including policymakers, including corporates, including civil society, including researchers. So we wanted it to be a very comprehensive index. But to make it simpler, as, as I said, we, we, we have these country scorecards profiles, but we also have a, an extensive program. As you know, we're part of the Economist Group, so we are a publisher as well, in addition to doing research projects like this. So we have a blog uh, series. Throughout the year, we invite bloggers to write about what the index means for their context. So for example, we had uh, a blogger from, from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa was talking about uh, what the, some of the indicators mean for them in their context. Uh, we also had the European Commissioner last year uh, on, on, on the Health Commissioner talk about what the health indicators mean and so on. So we basically, we have this blog a program that, that puts the index in context and local context. Um, but we also have a, an, a series of articles that we published throughout the year that link the index with uh, developments such as new food labeling guidelines in different countries. Uh, recently, we had the World Food Day. We were focusing on what what is what is new in these kind of global fora. What does the what does FAO do? So we are we actually publishing a lot of content around the index, and that is almost as important as the index itself because it's about how it's communicated, keeping the conversation going, bringing the stakeholders all together. So that's another way how we make it more accessible. I see. Very good. So, kind of very three different ways of of addressing that that uh, sometimes not sometimes all the time frustrating uh, tension. I like to so so far we've been a bit technical talking about indicators and you know um, I'd like to raise up a bit almost uh, at the metaphysical level. The the next question is more about what was the the theory of change that was behind new index and by by that i mean the the fact that the choice of new indicators has reflected a particular vision a particular interpretation of what is important to consider and and you uh, on, on what you index is trying to to uh, to help addressing uh, so who are you trying to influence so can you tell me, uh, and then I, I would start with Jess and then Martin and and, uh, and Victoria. So can you tell me, for from your perspective, what was the again the type of theory of change that was or that is underpinning you your approach and your initiative? So Jess, can you tell us first? Yeah, and again, we used the high-level panel of experts on food systems framework, but um, that report was meant to look at food systems and how it can improve diets and nutrition. And this here enters the bias of the dashboard. When we developed it, we really wanted the dominant focus to be on, well, how can food systems improve diets and nutrition as a, as a major outcome? And I would say that's justified in that for way too long, food systems, food security dialogues have not focused enough on nutrition. Um, and that's why we have a massive burden of malnutrition, right? This is one of the big reasons is our food systems have, have um, not uh, worked as effectively as they, as they could. But um, it, that was sort of the, the, the 1.0 version. But now, of course, we can't, think about nutrition without thinking about planetary health, environmental health, equity, livelihoods, um, 
So we're expanding the dashboard because we really want it to be a tool that's useful for the whole food system summit that, that Jean-Francois Francois had pointed out. So um, we're expanding that now, but it's initial, our initial bias was to highlight uh, the importance of diets and nutrition and food systems. So I'll readily admit that. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. I wouldn't call it a bias, I would say a focus. Uh, that's good. So can we, can we from Martin, and then we'll hear from, from Victoria, what was their bias uh, when the economist unit uh, was thinking of developing this, this particular um, uh, index? Martin. Well, I would say uh, our, our bias was to, to be radically neutral because, I mean, that's that's how we are. <laughs> so the thing is that at the Economist Group, as you know, and, and especially at the Economist Intelligence Unit as, as well, we are we start with, you know, a, a blank sheet of paper where we just say, you know, um, let's collect the evidence here. Uh, we, we are not... Uh, um, a campaigning organization. So we that's what we are renowned for. We are renowned for creating that uh, credible evidence. Uh, we, we started with the, that, that neutrality rather than a specific bias. So we, we didn't really work towards a certain outcome. We didn't start with the outcome and then say, okay, so which indicators do we need to get to that outcome? As mm -hmm. I said, we had those three key um you know the, the, those three key challenges that the food system faces that seem to be contradictory so we have the food loss and waste which is you know almost one billion people suffer from hunger but a third of food is lost or wasted um then we have sustainable agriculture is all about um you know climate change impacts agricultural systems and we have less and less uh, sustainable land uh, for agriculture and 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 we, we really need agriculture to to be a carbon sink i mean to to capture carbon um, um, and nutrition challenges as well. So we have the hungry and the obese coexist and there are rising rates of obesity as well as uh, for every person that suffers from undernutrition, there are two that are overweight or obese. So these are the three uh, core uh, challenges, but we didn't say uh, this is the outcome we need to achieve. We just said, why do we have those uh, challenges? And let's find the indicators that capture those challenges and that can give policymakers as well as business and civil society a snapshot, a picture of what's happening, and then they can drill deep into what can my country do, what can stakeholders in my country do. Um, so that's that's how we start. We didn't start with a bias. We rather started with this credible evidence base. Okay, let's forget about the bias. Let's talk about emphasis. And uh, I think the emphasis for, for you, Martin, was really the evidence uh, of trying or trying to put the evidence on, on the table. Um, so, Victoria, from, from the benchmarking uh, initiative, so what was, again, your, your initial theory of change? How did you hope to change the world through that uh, benchmarking? Yes, great, great question. So, yeah, our our, our angle of focus is really uh, the company performances. As as you know, with SDGs, the private sector should play a key role. So how are, are we going to measure that and what are our expectations? So we really wanted to put out um, into a roadmap, like what are the steps that companies can take and, um, and, and, and set the bar high and by that incentivizing really a race to the top so that that in short is the theory of change to 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 highlight best practice and really showcase what is already being done because sometimes in certain spheres you'd say oh gosh a company can never um you know on their own uh, do better on air quality or soil or or, or a nutritional uh, diet of consumers but then if one company is doing it then it proves that 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 that, it, that the likelihood is there and the 350 companies that we look at represent over half of global revenue. So it's a huge chunk. And, and so that is the theory of change, how we, we definitely try to stay as neutral as possible. And, and, and luckily through our donors, we are being pushed at that. So we're being funded by, by governments and philanthropic institutions. So that really um, focuses us as well, not to take any steps into implementing or being a consultant in any way, just really providing as clear as possible data sets and also in the data sets, we also focus on 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 the on the issues that are mostly non-political. So we're not there to take sides. We're we're there to collab well to uh, bring together where there is consensus, 
and uh, and translate that for these companies. That th these companies are active in so many multiple countries. So each country has different national national strategies and national legislation. So to really lift that overall uh, level. And, and that's the third step that comes in with, with the alliance. So we are an alliance. So that means that other stakeholder groups um, incentivize what we do and, and, and want to take our data forward. And so our alliance consists of investors, of civil society organizations, but also from business associations. So that can, they can mirror how their members are doing in, in the broader group as, as opposed to peers and really push them to perform better. Okay, so to the risk of oversimplifying, I think the benchmarking was really coming with a theory of change around companies, uh, which, which is, I think, uh, I think uh, you know, a very, very important actor's input system. So actually for the, the fourth question, I'd like to kind of build on this recognition that these different actors, different components, and, and uh, take on what Jess was mentioning initially, the recognition that effectively if you want to be comprehensive in, in embracing the, the different uh, dimension of, of your food system, you need to recognize that there is different component. And uh, my question to you then, uh, and uh, I would like to hear from Martin and then Victoria and Jess is, so those different component food systems, the drivers, the outcomes, how did you uh, actually make the distinction between them into your analysis? So, how does you index or you dashboard or you benchmark a distinct, make the distinction between sustainability indi indicators, between food system outcomes, between driver of changes, or even entry for uh, entry point for policy intervention? So Martin, can you try to see how the uh, unit uh, at the Economist has tried to maintain those uh, conceptual distinctions? you know, difference between those different aspects or different components of food system. Yes, definitely, Chris. So, I mean, we try to include both. I mean, as you could see with the kind of indicators we have, we have a, a balance of of them because we thought that it, it, it's it's not, not enough to just have either of them. So, if, for example, if you just focus on food system outcomes, then we are not really highlighting what governments um, can do in terms of policy levers, in terms of uh, the, the strengthening the systemic uh, environment in which food systems operate. So for example, things like corruption or human rights, uh, protections of, of property rights, uh, things like equality, inequality, income inequality, and those kind of things. So it, it, it's not enough to just focus on the food system outcomes and sustainability indicators. We also have to look at those other ones. But we, um, we have a balance of around two thirds or so of our indicators. I mean, that's just a rough um, summary of, of our indicators are food system outcome indicators and, and some sustainability indicators and the rest so about one third is drivers of change and policy levers because we did they did want to have that uh, dimension in it so for example we were looking at things like um, insurance i mean access to insurance is vital for farmers for example or access to finance access to credit property rights those kind of things so we need to have these kind of um, policy levers in there um, at the same time, we wanted to have um, income and human rights, corruption, um, and, and so socioeconomic indicators in there to provide those kind of, to highlight the drivers of change. Um, because, you know, to what degree can a sustainable system really exist if you don't have these, you know, th this kind of supportive environment? So we focus on sustainability indicators and full system outcomes. But for each of the three categories, we also have about a third or so of indicators focus on policy and drivers of change. And that is, in our opinion, the, the right balance for the purpose of our index. Very good. Okay. Uh, Victoria, would you agree with what Martin proposed or do you have your own view on how to make sure that you distinct uh, in your benchmarking the different aspect of the system? 
Yeah, well, actually, uh, Chris, it, it, it very much comes down also to what then uh, the indicators and the benchmark results are. So, as I said, our, our focus is so clearly um, on what companies can possibly influence. So that already narrows it down. Mm -hmm. But then if we actually measure that, we do see that there is a very different level in where companies are actually acting. So that could also feed in. And I mean, we have people working within our team as well on the engagement side, on policy advocacy to really provide like a policy feedback mechanism. Because if we see that certain indicators may scientifically already well established, so companies could act upon it, but are not doing so, then mm. you'd think uh, probably maybe policy has, has a really important role to play. But I think we'd all agree that we well, not every topic is suitable, not the end goal should not, not be that we just want policy on everything. So that it, it's, it provides a good measurement, I think, in our results. And then forthcoming, of course, each year you'd have a revision and then you can redefine whether certain indicators should be kept in or not uh, based mm. upon, upon the results and, and what you find in the data sets. I see. So a slight different approach. Uh, Good. I guess, Jess, I, I, I kind of imagine what you're going to answer because you started from the um, high-level palette of expert framework. But still, uh, can you, uh, again, take us through what you made to make sure that conceptually your, your dashboard is actually correct in the sense that you make the distinction because an, an outcome is very different from a driver's one. So how did you address that issues in the dashboard? Yeah, we really um, kept them quite distinct. So if you go through what's called the compare and analyze uh, direction of the dashboard, you'll see we've kept those elements, the food supply chains, food environments, the individual factors, drivers and outcomes quite uh, separate. And you can look at those in different ways. Uh, you can um, map outcomes with drivers, you know, in, in looking at bubble charts and things like that and spirit of Hans Rosling. Um, so it was, so we've kept them quite distinct and, you know, there's, there's a lot of indicators on food supply. We've got a lot of indicators on food environments and outcomes, um, on drivers. Um, it's a bit trickier because drivers, many of them are exogenous to the food system. Um, so we really tried to curate different drivers that cut across urbanization, population pressure, climate, inequity. Um, but there's a lot more work we can do. But to me, you can have an indicator that shows a driver, but if it's exogenous to the food system and you you can show an association with it with an outcome, but you're still left a little bit of, of not really understanding how that driver is influencing food systems. So we're always a little bit cautious on the driver side because um, it does not represent causality of certain outcomes that the food system may bear. So um, we've been a bit more hesitant of adding a lot of driver indicators right now until we can better show relationships and the systems thinking of those drivers and how they influence certain types of food systems. Yeah, you are very cautious, um, these drivers. Uh, I know we've been working on drivers, actually, of food system, because at the end of the day, if we don't understand those drivers, uh, it's going to be very difficult for policymakers to actually know which one they need to put on push yeah. to try to nudge the system in one direction as opposed to another. Okay, uh, you've been fantastic at, at keeping time. I just have one more area that I would like to hear from the from the four of you, but I'm going to uh, go, go back to Carla maybe for that. Is the issues of of the the time or the temporal dimension, if I may use that term, the temporal dimension of food system and the fact that those food systems are changing, evolving all the time. So population grow, preferences of consumers change, market are shifting, science is advancing. So my question to you, starting with, with Carla and then Jess and, and, and Martin at the end is, how does you index or you benchmark capture that uh, dynamical aspect uh, and reflect the fact that sustainability itself is not a static on point, but is going to move and, uh, and change over time. 
So Carla first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think again here our starting point I think was the SDGs and the yeah global agenda for 2030 is really that we felt there's no time to lose. Um, so we want to start now and probably there's enough certainty among many areas, um, even though, yeah, not everything is 100% clear, um, but there is good consensus and the direction of travel is pretty clear so that, yeah, effectively we companies know where they have to act upon and we know, yeah, like what we want to see. So kind of having that starting point and then knowing with the Food System Summit next year, like the time is right to push the sector now to put, come out with a call to action maybe this year and to really use that summit next year for a real decade of action. Um, yeah, and therefore we felt even though we won't have the indicators perfect, like nowhere near uh, like the, in the first year, but we, yeah, we really wanted to, um, yeah, to, to start with this and then improve indicators over time and and learn from what is yeah learn from developments um, around us and like latest societal expectations or latest scientific evidence um, to tweak indicators make them smarter over time and I think one example is for example the science based target network which is developing um, like science based targets not only for uh, climate, but also like now for um, other topics like the broader nature and these science-based targets, which are due to come out in 2022, for example, we then try to build in as indicators into our benchmark. So with these developments we aim to follow, um, but basically with having, yeah, um, setting a starting point already now. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, sorry, I mean, we, we, we have a second session coming up. So. Oh, sorry. Um, no, I just would like to give the chance to Jess and Martin to also oh. address the issue of dimensionality before we pass. So, Jess, very quickly, how do yeah. you do we, that? To yeah, we, we try to add a temporal element to all our indicators. So for every indicator, almost every indicator, we start from the 1960s to present day. So it allows you to see trends over time. I think that's a powerful way to look at the temporal aspects is just yep. add the time element to every indicator. So we try to do that. Wherever possible, indeed. Martin, very quickly, how did the unit manage or try to manage to capture that uh, changing nature of food system and sustainability? Yeah, so we definitely looked into what are, uh, first of all, what is what new data is available uh, from, you know, what has changed in terms of the data sources. And then because we expanded the index, I mean, initially we had about 20 or so countries and 33 and now 67, the comparability of the index in any case was tricky because of that. Um, so we we focused less on being able to compare to previous years, but we focus more on does the index still represent what we think is a sustainable food system. So that's why mm -hmm. in the most recent uh, iteration, we looked at um, more of the socioeconomic indicators that we hadn't focused as much on. And uh, some of the feedback we got is, you know, with the SDGs is that, you know, what about those types of indicators and particularly for investing in sustainable agriculture. So we added access to finance indicators, access to fintech, which is really increasingly important for land users. We had more indicators and protection of for land users, financial access and protection. Uh, sovereign debt, as I mentioned before, is an important indicator because if the sovereign debt is high, uh, private um, private investors are less likely to invest in uh, sustainable agriculture, for example. And um, also we looked at forest area, which is also an important indicator, kind of a proxy indicator to look at environmental biodiversity and the impact of land use. So we added indicators as we looked more closely at uh, capturing um, how sustainable food systems uh, contribute to the SDGs. Okay, um, we would love to continue the discussion. And, and I know there's a very long list of, of questions that came up. We don't have time to address them. And again, I would like to invite the people who posted those questions to follow up with the, the presenters. I'd like to really thank the four presenters of today to stay in time, to be clear and concise. And now I would like to uh, pass the, the baton to uh, the next two chair, which are Alison Loconto and Elise Golan, that will uh, facilitate the rest of that uh, session three.
Thank you very much to the four of you. That was really very informative. And I hope the audience have appreciated. Thank you. Hello again, I'm Alison Locanto. I am Deputy Director of the Interdisciplinary Laboratory on Science, Innovation and Society at the French National Research Institute for Food, Agriculture and Environment. So for those of you who are just joining us, this is the second part of session three, the science of characterizing and assessing the transitions towards more sustainable food systems. And what we're going to uh, continue to do right now in this session is to, um, uh, expand upon what we've been talking about so far this morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. And basically what uh, what we've been discussing is that a food system is, is much more than the simple production and consumption of food. It gathers together all of this different range of elements that we've been talking about, environment, people, inputs, finance, infrastructures, institutions, and the activities that relate to the production, processing, distribution, and consumption of food. And also we as actors in our in our own uh, local, national, and, and global food systems, we're responsible for the outputs of these activities. And uh, in, this is in particularly including uh, delivering these social, economic, and environmental outcomes that we are that we are, that we want. Uh, these uh, latter elements here, they're they're quite important for the policymakers among us, who are responsible uh, specifically for developing policies that can encourage good practices, that contribute to sustainability, and inversely discourage those that can't. So, information about uh, potential policy impacts on the different elements, activities, and outcomes of food systems, uh, these things alone alert policymakers to broader impacts and trade-offs of policy, including the potential unintended co consequences. So successful policy for the transition for the sustainable food systems must consider and manage trade-offs. Why? Well, it's because it's difficult to, to be able to achieve everything that you want to, to achieve, all of your objectives with just one single intervention. Um, for example, if we think about uh, the sustainability objectives that we have for our food systems, we realize that we must achieve a number of things. For example, we need to feed a growing population, not just with enough nutrients, but with a diversity of food and with enough income that will help us to live healthy, productive and fulfilling lives. We need to ensure that this food we produce doesn't deplete the natural resources that are the source of our ability to live on the planet. So it's not just the food that we eat that's important, but it's actually the water that we drink, the air that we breathe. They're all affected and interrelated in the way uh, in which we produce food. And now even more pressure is placed on what these resources can provide us due to the changing climate. Finally, we have to ensure that food, that the food that we um, uh, consume doesn't harm us in terms of our own health and social relations that often condition how we eat and how we engage with others within the food system. And this uh, has to deal with, you know, the business practices that we use, the way that we organize uh, the actual physical movement from food from one place from the farm to the plate. So the purpose of today is to talk through these types of trade-offs and see what happens in, in real life. So I'm going to hand over the floor now to Elise Golan, who's going to explain to us um, uh, what's going on and uh, introduce these real-life experiences that we have. Elise, please, the floor is yours. Oh. 
<laughs> nice to see you, Allison. Thank you. So I'm Elise Golan. I'm the Director for Sustainable Development at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And food systems are my life. I live and breathe food systems. So I'm happy to join you all today. Now, as Allison said, now it's time for us to roll up our sleeves and walk through three real-life case studies and look at the types of trade-offs that the managers of these projects had to consider when they were thinking about building support for their projects. For each case study, we're first going to have a brief presentation by one of the case study managers. And then we are going to uh, ask you, the audience, to weigh in and help us think about the trade-offs that the, the, the case study presented. So we'll begin quickly. We'll go to our first case study. The presenter is Natalie Pinto Alvero. And Natalie leads the food system program in Latin America for Recolto. And she is part of the Food Smart Cities International Cluster at Recolto. The case study Natalie will present is on a sustainable landscape management approach to save the lake that feeds Nicaragua City. Natalie, off to you. Thank you very much, Elise. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the neat organization, Elise. Um, so a quick introduction to the case study for today. Uh, we're going to talk about Lake Apanes, and I wanted to share with you uh, an image from the lake where that we are going to be talking about. So that's the that's the Lake Apanes uh, located in uh, Hinotega Department in Nicaragua. And as you may see here, it is sourced from several rivers. And these three rivers drag an average of 4,000 tons of sediment per year due to deforestation and intensive land use, as we will discuss later. And forest has been reduced by 26%. So as consequences, we see the loss of landscape beauty, but also, uh, the, and most importantly, the contamination, migration, poverty, and unemployment of the people who uh, inhabit the landscape, the area. So uh, for, for this exercise, um, and as a concept basis, I know probably this is interesting for many of you, we're using integrated landscape management. And um, this means that we need to understand the landscape, decide on the results expected. Um, and of course, as you may see, there are intended, unintended consequences. Then design the intervention and action plan, implement according to it, but of also, of course, be flexible and adapt. And uh, okay, so probably I'll stop here because we'll see later the social, economic, and environmental actions that we have taken. And so uh, back to you, dear Liz. Great. So the 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 main goals of the uh, project that Natalie is explaining is they want to have more sustainable vegetable production, and they want to have a reduction in deforestation. So achieving these long-term goals uh, include uh, some, some actions that are gonna have some short-term impacts. And some of those short-term impacts are gonna be negative. So what we're going to do, and many will be positive, but what we're gonna do now is take a deep dive, a little bit deeper dive into some possible uh, short-term trade-offs and look at the challenges that those trade-offs pose to the project managers. So Allison, if you can pop up our slides on the Recolto, right. So in the, in the short run, we're turning to you, the audience members, to help us start thinking through there, through this problem. So let's start with people. We're gonna, we're gonna look at the three dimensions of sustainable development. We're gonna talk about people, planet, and prosperity. So let's start with people. In the short term, were there, were there trade-offs that the team faced when they were looking at social well-being? Were there possible short-term social costs that pose barriers to the success of the project? We now we challenge everyone in the audience to consider potential costs and short-term trade-offs. In the short term, do you think, next slide, next slide, do you think that action to reduce deforestation and soil erosion and chemical runoff due to cultivation, vegetable cultivation, would have had positive or negative impacts on community health and well-being. So now a poll is going to appear on your screen and you need to choose whether you think 
that these actions would have mostly negative or positive effects on social well being and community health. And when, when thinking about your responses, you may want to consider impacts on vegetable cultivation. What kind of impacts would there be on vegetable cultivation? You may also, you need to um, click on the notification as the poll is popping up here. So you want to think about what kind of impacts this action might have had on vegetable cultivation. How would action to reduce soil erosion impact labor required for vegetable cultivation in the short term? How about meal cooking and household heating? How would action to reduce deforestation impact cooking and heating? Okay, how would all of these efforts add up? So we see the poll results, results and we get that about 63% of you thought that these actions would have positive short-term impacts, and about 37% thought they would have negative short-term impacts. Let's go to the next screen and see what the project managers thought. The project managers actually identified a number of short-term social costs that could represent obstacles to the success of the project. In the short term, when it comes to vegetable cultivation, conservation actions would require more labor in the short term. For meal cooking and household eating, heating without wood, cooking meals and heating would be more difficult in the short run. How about availability of vegetables? Conservation efforts could reduce vegetable production and availability in the short run. Okay, so that, that's a possible negative, a possible um, barrier. How about short-term trade-offs for the environment? Let's go to the next slide. In the short term, do you think action to reduce deforestation and soil erosion, erosion and chemical runoff due to vegetable cultivation would have positive or negative impacts on the environment? Let's run the poll. When thinking about your response, you may want to consider impacts on soil health. How would these actions impact soil health? How about forest health? You think in the short term, efforts to deforest to reduce deforestation would impact forest health? How about health of the lake in the short term? So all of these planetary impacts, in the short term, what would this action have on soil health, forest health, lake health? Got the poll running there. Let's see what you think. And remember a lot of these impacts on the planet are of course long-term impacts. Impacts that we are building for, making change now, so that in the future, over time. Okay, so in the short term, 74% of you thought that there would be positive impacts on the planet, and 25% thought there would be negative impacts on the planet. Well, the project um, managers thought, well, okay, in the short term, maybe there would be weak, very weak impacts, positive impacts on the environment, but they wouldn't be strong enough to really stimulate community support. No, it's often those long-term impacts that are matter. Okay, let's look at economic well-being. Let's look at impacts on prosperity. In the short term, do you think that action to reduce deforestation and soil erosion and chemical runoff due to vegetable cultivation would have positive or negative impacts on economic prosperity? Okay, let's run the poll. While you're thinking about this, you want to think about what would be the impacts on the short term on farmer income if we're having them move away from uh, uh, the practices they're using now to more uh, environmentally friendly practices in the short term, what impacts would that have? How about, think about this poll, how about a forester income? In the long run, I mean, in the short term, what would efforts to stop deforestation have on uh, forester income? 
How about cost of cooking and heating? How about the price of vegetables for urban consumers? Let's see what the what you think about this. I'm waiting for the poll results. But remember, we're thinking about short-term impacts here, not long-term impacts. And so in the short term, what do you think it would have on impact on prosperity for people in the area? Um, we're looking. Uh, so on farmer income, on forester income, on cost of cooking and heating. And I think I'm still waiting for those results. And okay. Let's go ahead and say that um, about uh, two thirds of you thought that that would have in the short term impacts, positive impacts on economic prosperity and about a third negative impacts. Let's go to the next slide. And actually in the short term, uh, the project managers thought that economic impacts could represent obstacles to the success of the project. When it comes to farmer income, farmers would have lower production and lower income. Forester income, definitely lower income, can no longer harvest forest. Project assessment thought that there would be higher expenses for fuel and cooking and heating if you couldn't use wood. And the price of vegetables for urban consumers could probably go up if there's less supply from the area around their Parnas region. Okay, so next slide, please. So in the analysis of the short-term costs, look that there were definite um, uh, barriers to the project managers in building support for the project in the community. Um, barriers when it comes to community well-being and some positives but not very strong for the planet and some barriers when it comes to economic well-being. So now turn to Natalie to explain how the project managed these um, potential barriers to get to green. Thank you, Elise. Uh, so, as you may see, um, during the the uh, the work in this territory, you know, we we um, gathered many people who are um, living in this landscape and who are also profiting from it. No, so over the past thirty years, um, we have seen that uncontrolled deforestation and harmful practices have deteriorated environmental the environmental um, aspect around the lake to such an extent that the lake could actually disappear in the next five years um, due to sedimentation and pollution. And we see that vegetable cultivation in particular has had a high impact on environmental quality in the lake basin due to the um, bad agricultural practices. No, So what we started to do is to first establish this multi-stakeholder platform so that we can listen to each other and understand um, the, the barriers and difficulties. No? So we understood that, for example, land tenure is an issue and that when families inherit the land, uh, people actually have a motivation to cut down the forest because they know that they can make one uh, $10,000 from a nectar uh, by cultivating vegetables or other crops like coffee even. So um, in time, uh, we, uh, we started to uh, work on different aspects. You know? So for example, in terms of the social cohesion, as I was explaining, um, all the actions of that uh, Ricolto and Maslago, this platform that was created by all the stakeholders in the lake, helped to build social cohesion and inspire community action to improve the sustainability of the Lake Apanas Basin and to invest time and resources to the protection of the lake. So we're very excited that this is a, a dynamic platform where people get together and each one of them contributes. So for example, the universities have performed different studies to assess sedimentation. The indigenous communities are also continuously monitoring what's happening in the lake fishermen are also taking action and all the different stakeholders, no? In terms of environment, we also, uh, we also work together with private companies, for example, to collect agrochemical containers 
And um, in 2020, in 2020, we have already collected more than 150,000 containers. Um, also based on the data from 2019, 28% of the families who inhabit the Lake Apennas micro basin implemented at least one practice related to erosion control, included reduced drainage speed and tramping of sediments to reduce the impact of erosion. By 2021, so next year, we expect that at least uh, 25% of the farmers are implemented are implementing good environmental practices. And also interestingly enough, over 2050 eco stops have been installed in the Lake Appen. So many people <clears throat> cut wood, also cut the trees to have wood uh, for cooking. And so we have seen that eco stops um, can reduce the consumption of wood in home by up to 40%. So over the five years, such a reduction would translate into saving up to 30 trees for each family using a stove. This means that these 250 eco-stoves have potential to save 7,500 trees and also, of course, protect the health of the families because many of them, um, as you can imagine, have respiratory illnesses because of inhaling the... the um, yeah, the 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 the, uh, the <laughs> I say the umo from the from the eco cooking, and in terms of economic, we have seen that uh, luckily in time farmers have been able to establish contracts with uh, large retailers, and they deliver the food with better practices to the city of Manawa. So we have seen in these past years that the average of farmers' income from vegetable has increased by almost 50% between 20, uh, 2017 and 2019. And then, I don't know, Elise, now I also mentioned the main lessons learned, or, or do I get back to you? Thank you, Natalie. I think in the interest of time, we're going to have to move on to the next case study. And then if we have time at the end, we can go back to each one for lessons learned. Um, just in the interest of time. So I would like to introduce then our next case, case study presenter. William uh, Chifulia is the HIVO South, America, South Africa Regional Advocacy Manager for Sustainable Diets. He leads the policy advocacy and campaign on safe, nutritious, environmental friendly, accessible and healthy food. The case study he will present is the Zambian Food Change Lab. William, thank you. I correct, correct pronunciation to my name, I'm William Chilofia, but well done uh, for getting closer to that. Um, yeah, so as I just set up my uh, screen, okay, yep. So as, as she has explained, I come from Hebrew, Southern Africa, uh, where we have been implementing um, the Zambia Food Change Lab, whose um, main objective is to try and address some of uh, the food um, system challenges that are quite apparent, uh, apparent in the country. Um, Zambia is um, it's, 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 um, it's a country with high levels of um, malnutrition. We have about 35% of our children under, under the age of um, five uh, stunted. And we also have um, obesity and overweight on the other hand uh, growing up. And then um, at the same time, we note that um, our government has been so committed to promoting one type of crop for, uh, I think most of it could even be political reason, but could also be, uh, you know, when we got into independence and how maize was just introduced as um, a measure to try and address food security issues. But we also note that um, uh, the maize is really challenged now, uh, especially that due to climate change, we have droughts, we have pests, we have diseases that are just attacking uh, maize, and in other cases, you can even see 
that if you have other crops in your field, the other crops wouldn't be attacked. What, what would be attacked would just be maize. So actually it's becoming a risky kind of crop um, in the country. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the challenges um, that uh, we seek to address, as I've said, there's um, that uh, mono, mono diets where people are frequently eating just one type of um, one type of food, which has resulted into malnutrition. Actually, the government themselves, uh, the government of Zambia, has uh, clearly put it that. Um, Zambia is in the state of malnutrition because of um, the mono diet that we are um, experiencing. Um, then in terms of um, how we got to just go about to address these uh, food system challenges, we came up with um, a food lab. Uh, in the food lab, we brought different stakeholders uh, together uh, from different sectors. And uh, the majority of them were civil society. Uh, we also had farmers, we also had um, a government, and we regularly uh, met as um, a food change lab. And we had defined topics. We had what we called a food map. So in this food map, which was done at the first meeting that we had, which looked at what are sort of the key challenges that have been um, that that are really challenging Zambia in terms of uh, food, and we came up with those and had to find ways and means to address them. So, in terms of actions that we took, we had to address these same um, food system challenges that were identified through a food map uh, in what we called like prototype groups. We had one group that was so highly interested in. Um, coming up with uh, crop diversification. So we called it the crop diversity group. We also had another group that thought, okay, awareness raising is really key uh, around the food system. So that was a group called awareness raising, but also the youth inclusion was also very key in the process because the majority of the youth now uh, are not so much in agriculture, but with them getting into agriculture is really key to change uh, the food system in Zambia. So we had another group which you call it informal food system. So in this informal food system, this is the one that tried to address where the majority of us get our foods. 90% of Zambians get their foods from these informal markets. So there was a particular group that was addressing that particular um, uh, group, but that particular issue. So in terms of um, trade-offs, um, so the, the main challenge uh, for the Food Change Lab was to make the case for diversification of the Zambian food system, uh, which we looked at from the aspect of production and uh, consumption. We called it diversity on the, on the field as well as on the plate. So yes, to, to try and increase diversity, uh, public health issues, so fertility, as you know, uh, just how bad the fertilizers would spoil the soil, and the like. So I also wanted to address agrobiodiversity. Uh, but we also noted that apart from the market that were challenging for these other new crops, there was also an issue of seeds. So you can try to move around and try to get seeds. So just last weekend myself, I tried to see, uh, to begin planning to plant because the rain season had just come up. So you could go around and round, you, you couldn't find, or I couldn't find uh, diverse seeds on the market. So, and that has also resulted into the market issues. So there is, I think, uh, you know, potential risk of shifting from uh, maize to other crops like sorghum millet, sorghum and millet, um, that it would, result, it would result into some uh, short term kind of food security issues. But also there's also a gap in terms of how do we actually plant some of these um, crops that were originally growing, but now, are actually being forgotten. In terms of results that we um, we had um, achieved, uh, we 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 did we 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 did a research which looked at um, agriculture, food system, diet, and nutrition uh, in Zambia, 
And um, this work was led by, uh, he was in the partner, IIED, and, uh, and the lab participants. And this has been a very useful tool in, in terms of understanding what we need to do um, to move away from um, maize dependency. And then the youth group itself um, did quite a number of activities, but one inspirational activity that it did was to just begin uh, innovations around backyard gardening in, uh, in Lusaka and also uh, sharing lessons of the encounters through radio, uh, that's the media, and also uh, through Facebook and the like. And we also did a food value book that we try to document the local foods that are available in Lusaka to just basically show the people to say there are also these other foods. Because now a lot of um, Zambian citizens, especially in Lusaka, I think they've become so limited to modern foods and slowly forgetting about the traditional foods that we have. So he was documented, uh, you know, he was together with the lab partners, documented the foods that are available in Chongwe. And now what we did, we're just, we're almost done with showing um, uh, the cook show, which we did. We've got celebrities, including politicians, to come and demonstrate how you cook some of these foods. So uh, a show has been running on our TVs, which is really exciting, and we've gotten a lot of support around that. Uh, in terms of the markets and the socioeconomic aspect, we now have um, the forum that has been created or a platform with the Lusaka City Council. Uh, where they're doing planning in terms of capacity building activities with vendors. And I'm, I'm just going to jump in. This is fabulous. This is very interesting. We are we are beyond time now, though. So uh, we, we're not going to run through the poll on you. But Alison, if you could just show the last slide for the yeah. um, Kivos case study, we can illustrate very quickly the type sure. of uh, the, I guess we'll show the next one. We, we know that in the short term, there were some uh, possible trade-offs that could have posed constraints to the success of the project. Uh, the, time the time commitment needed for such a, a wonderful community building effort uh, could have been a negative for some people. We know that in the beginning, some of the environmental benefits would have been very small or negligible. And we know that as um, William mentioned, that in the short term, this switch from monocropping to a crop that didn't have ready markets could have been a, a knock on people's, on farmers' incomes. So we know there were some challenges that the project had to confront and they did it. And now in the, the interest of time, we're just gonna to move to our, our third case study here. Um, I'm happy to in, uh, invite, um, let's see, here is Freddie. He's going to introduce the, he's a knowledge manager. Are you, are you ready to go? We are ready to go here, Freddie, and uh, we're jumping in. Freddie Williams is a Knowledge Manor Consultant uh, in the Environment, Climate, Gender, and Social Inclusion Department at the International Fund for Agricultural Development. The case study he'll present today is a coastal climate resilient infrastructure project in Bangladesh. Freddie, all yours. Thank you. Thanks very much for that introduction, Elise. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Okay. Um, yeah, so thanks for that introduction. So that's a little bit about me. The, the project that I'm introducing is the Coastal Climate Resilient Infrastructure Project in Bangladesh. So the project was carried out in the Barazal region of Bangladesh, which is highlighted on the map here. Um, it's characterised geographically by being on a low deltaic floodplain, um, and there are high incidences of poverty in the region. So as you can see on the slide, 26.7% uh, of people were considered extremely poor at the onset of the project and 14.7% were undernourished. Um, due to the geographical location, the area is really vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, especially extreme weather events, um, particularly tidal surges, cyclones and floods. Um, so the objectives of the project were to enhance the climate resilience of coastal roads and markets um, and improve livelihoods for poor households. So the predominant livelihood activity in the region is agriculture, which is also a vulnerable sector to those uh, natural disasters and impacts of climate change. Um, currently, Bangladesh is seventh um, 
in the world climate change long-term climate risk index so there's a prediction that by 2050 more than 35 million people from these coastal regions could be displaced um one of the uh, big social issues with all these compounding factors is that the marginalized female community are um, more susceptible to those poverty perpetuating situations um, so as i said the aim was to shore up the resilience of coastal roads and markets targeting populations in the catchment areas of project markets and project roads so the aim was to reach about 3.5 million people um, with this infrastructure project um, and as I say, there was a core focus on female empowerment and social inclusion throughout the development of this infrastructure. Um, so this is obviously an infrastructure project. It's a little different to the other two that we've seen. Um, it aims at increasing incomes and access to markets, access to agricultural inputs, um, and how food can be distributed and services distributed throughout the regions and try and give people that extra access to income opportunities um, and leverage synergies with other sectors by nature of the region being more accessible through the roads, um, providing more income opportunities and more opportunities to then look at um, sustainable agricultural practices once the access for those agricultural inputs is there. Um, so just a few key strategies or actions before we go back to Elise. Um, so we looked at raising the infrastructure, so the markets and the roads, so that they were out of harm's way from flooding. Um, flood resistant roads were also stabilized with vetiver grass um, as part of the climate sensitive measures. But one of the key instruments in this project was the use of labor contracting societies. Um, so these local labor societies uh, gather people from the local community with similar economic backgrounds um, and they often comprise um, destitute women or landless labourers who are really dependent um, on the labour for income. Um, so this ensures the participation of those marginalised groups from the onset of the project. From, of the project. Um, so it gives them that enhanced income opportunity. Um, so I think we can go back to you now, Elise, for the, for the polls. Great, thank you. So let's take a closer look at some of the short term trade offs that the project had to confront. Let's first look at some of the short term trade offs when it comes to uh, the social well being and health of the community. So when you think about that short term impacts on the community's well being, in the short term, do you think that action to enhance the climate resilience of coastal roads and market infrastructures in the project area would have had positive or negative impacts on community well-being and have everyone take the poll now um, and consider some some potential impacts to consider are the social inclusion and empowerment of women or of other marginalized groups did the project have any short-term impacts on that how about first food security did the project have any short-term impacts on food security um, that would um, be problematic to the success of the project set up any barriers on the project um, so hopefully you're looking at the poll and we'll see what the poll results are. Do you think in the short term, these uh, actions, uh, infrastructure actions would have impacts on community well-being and health in the short term? What would those be when you think if it would be anything would happen in the short term to food security or to social inclusion? Uh, what kind of impacts do you think that would have they, the project would have in the short term so so most of you 77 percent thought it would be positive impacts in the short term and indeed next slide please uh, there were positive impacts and those positive impacts were from labor opportunities uh, that benefited landless laborers included impoverished women the benefits come from income from laboring activities providing short-term financial security for laborers and in, um, enhanced financial access to food. So food security also a plus. Okay, how about short-term costs and trade-offs to the environment? Um, in the short term, do you think the action to enhance climate resilience of the coastal road and market infrastructures um, would have positive or negative impacts on the environment? Um, mostly positive or negative. 
Some things you might want to think about when you're thinking about the poll is, what do you think these infrastructure projects, what kind of impact would they have on soil health? What kind of impact on pollution in the area? You think they would have in the short term any impact on climate change and ecosystems? What kind of impacts do you think they would have on any of these environmental indicators? Um, remember, these are short-term incomes in, uh, impacts. We want to think about short-term impacts because we want to know if there are short-term constraints or barriers to project success. When it comes to the environment, of course, uh, it's usually a long-term impact. We'll see what the poll is telling us, what you all thought in the short term, if the project would have any positive or negative impacts on the planet, on the environment in the area on either social, uh, soil health, or pollution. Okay, 63% of you thought that the project in the short term would have positive impacts on the environment. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Actually, when you think about um, building roads and infrastructure, you usually think of uh, soil um, you know, erosion and those types of uh, impacts. So. When it comes to soil health, the project thought there possibly could be negative um, impacts due to construction, uh, but but they were upfront, uh, very intent on uh, putting in uh, these grasses to minimize erosion and to actually improve the environmental quality. When it comes to pollution, again, possibly negative. Uh, climate change in the eco ecosystems, uh, possibly negative due to the uh, disruption due to the construction. But um, in the long term, of course, that could change. Okay, how about short-term costs and trade-offs for economic well-being? Let's go to the next slide. What do you think the impact of these projects would be on short-term uh, prosperity for the communities in the area? When you're thinking about your responses here, think about what was going to happen to farmer income uh, with these new infrastructure projects. What about market access and economic opportunities? Remember, we're talking about the short term here. What would happen in the short term with these infrastructure projects? How about women's income in the short term? What would happen to economic prosperity in the area in the short term? And of course, short term is very different than long term uh, when we're trying to think about, even though we may have long term goals, we have to think about short-term constraints and possible barriers uh, due to some of these short-term trade-offs. Okay, and the poll results are um, coming up. I hope you're all voting, um, choosing your um, mostly negative or mostly positive there. And let's see what we've got. Slowly coming up here. As we think about what's happening here with the prosperity in the area, with these infrastructure projects. So 76 of you thought it was going to be positive short-term impacts. Let's go to the next slide. And of course, they were positive short-term impacts. And now um, I'll turn to the next slide and let Freddie explain more about how they got to, they were already at green um, because they did have overwhelming support, economic support for the uh, community. So Freddie, I'll let you explain how that happened. Thanks, Elise. Thanks, Elise. Um, so, yeah, to summarise the uh, increased economic activity. So, as I said at the beginning, the original aim was to reach around 3.5 million beneficiaries across the regions. Um, the actual impacts were, uh, it, they reached approximately 5.7 million people in the end. Um, so there was an end line survey carried out um, that measured traffic through the area, which increased by 125%. Um, there was also a 55% decrease in travel time, a 60% decrease in travel cost, and a 45% decrease in the region of vehicle operating costs. So that all contributes to the efficiency of distributing food and market serv services throughout the region. Um, so cumulatively, 750 kilometers of roads were built throughout the regions and just over five kilometers worth of small bridges and culverts were constructed as well. Um, so that, connect, that connectivity within the region really increased. Um, overall, we also built and rehabilitated 184 community markets um, and 178 market facilities, including processing and storage. Um, so that really helped to um, 
keep the produce safe from harm from the environment, from flooding, um, to prolong the lives of some products, products and processed goods into other saleable goods. Um, so in terms of the economic impact, this translated into um, a 75% increase in market turnover, a 60% increase in buyers and sellers, uh, and a 55% increase of traders. Um, and the lease value of markets also increased by 40%. Um, in terms of the income of individuals in the region, uh, the average growth in income was 29% for temporary and permanent traders at those market uh, at those uh, project markets. Um, so as a sort of culmination of all of these factors, 68% of beneficiaries reported improved food security as well um, through economic access to food and market services. Um, in terms of the, uh, the women empowerment, so 11 market section, sections were opened that were specifically for women. Um, six shops in each market were allocated just for women as well to, include, to increase participation uh, of women in markets and provide them with those income opportunities. Um, and off the back of the work for a lot of people from the uh, labouring construction societies, um, that gave people a startup income to put into their market opportunities and small businesses. So overall, the labour construction societies uh, produced just short of 70,000 working days um, for 5,700 people. 79% um, of these people were women. Um, and further to that, 8,200 people were also trained in business management to help them further diversify their activities and generate income. And of that 8,267% were female. In terms of the climate, climate preparedness of the region, um, as I said, project sites were, we aim to make them climate resilient. Um, project sites were raised by 80 centimetres above the highest flood levels um, in able to protect the markets, the infrastructure and the produce from flooding and extreme events. Um, and there are also uh, an increased number of cyclone shelters bit, built to protect the region from cyclones. Um, and also more than half a million people benefited from the Rural Radio Initiative, um, which informed people of climate information so that people could prepare for um, potential climate threats. Um, so just some of the lessons learned quickly. Um, one of the big ones is just that we are able to leverage synergies between sustainable agricultural practices, access to climate information and resilient infrastructure. So obviously here we're mostly looking at infrastructure, but looking at the partnerships between um, those other two factors, looking forward to that long term environmental impact as well. Um, another lesson is that targeting in terms of geographical location, um, in terms of people living in poverty or who are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, targeting those areas and those people enables our investment to have the biggest impacts that it can. Um, and especially when we look at areas where gender mainstreaming is required, um, involving women from the start of those projects, for example, in this one, in the labour contracting societies, um, can really give a further impact throughout the communities right from the start of the project. Um, yeah, thanks. Over to you, Elise. Great, thank you. Um, these, the, all of these case studies are so rich and I know we've gone very quickly through all of them. So I remind everyone who's, or tell everyone who's, who's listening in that all of the case studies are posted. There's a nice synopsis of each case study posted on the resources section for the conference website. So if you go there, you will find more information about the challenges, uh, lessons learned, and uh, the activities uh, undertaken by each one of these uh, project managers and case studies. So Alison, do you want to now join for a few closing remarks? Absolutely. Thank you, Elise. So, I mean, I think this was a fabulous session and uh, these three experiences that we've learned about uh, today, they illustrate very well the different types of trade-offs that uh, we are dealing with in everyday life. And listening to them, there are three points that, that came to my mind that I want to make and kind of uh, have as takeaway points for everybody in this session. So um, trade-offs at different points in time need to be identified and seriously considered in order to inform policy decisions that prioritize sustainability and achieve the greatest public good. 
often, you know, we we see uh, in these cases, they exemplify this very well, decisions must be taken where some people will win and others are going to lose in the short term. But uh, in the long term, benefits will come. This is important to remember when the returns feel as if they're too far off in the future to be taken into consideration in the short term. Uh, the second point I want to make is about um, evaluation and management of trade-offs. This requires inclusion of all stakeholders throughout the process and policy design. In other words, trade-offs can be managed and compromises can be made, but <laughs> active engagement among stakeholders is needed in order for these to work in practice. This is actually the governance element of sustainability that we also need to keep in mind when we think about the different pillars of sustainability. Finally, oftentimes some groups may feel that economic sustainability is being prioritized over environmental sustainability. And often social sustainability is not even considered. The cases that we've heard about today demonstrate that human dignity and social justice are important elements of what enable us to become and to be economically productive and to live within the limits of the planetary boundaries. So we wanna make sure that by considering the potential trade-offs that we, uh, that through this consideration, we don't create situations in which we don't want to live. And this is um, fundamental uh, to this entire process of, of uh, moving towards sustainability. So in some talk, thinking about what we talked about in the first session and in this one, food systems are dynamic and what we think is sustainable today may no longer be sustainable in the future. Therefore, it's important to keep a productive dialogue between scientists, practitioners, and policymakers in order to ensure that we can get the data that we need that will enable us to understand what the trade-offs are now and in the future. And also trade-offs, um, the management of trade-offs is a constant progress. And this is going to enable us to be able to uh, make progress towards uh, developing more sustainable food systems. Thank you, Elise. Great. So I'm going to just add one additional point to amplify uh, Alison's uh, comments, and that's that the trade-offs we face today may not be the trade-offs we face in the future, as Alison pointed out. Those trade-offs may become more dire. However, they could become less. The stark trade-offs we face today with respect to food production, farmer prosperity, and planetary boundaries could all change if we act today we could make those trade-offs less severe in the years to come with application of imaginative and innovative approaches, including to, related to agricultural production, supply chain management, business and consumer responsibility, we can begin to soften those trade-offs. Food system policy also plays a big role in managing and potentially softening some of these trade-offs, which leads me to remind everyone that to tune in again tomorrow, Friday, for session four, towards holistic assessment of food systems policies, which further builds on today's discussions. So thank you everyone for a very interesting session. Um, I look forward to tuning in tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you.